This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. So then today it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Elrod. He comes from uh, Park, uh, known to people older than 40 previously as Xerox Park. They lost the Xerox. And the important thing to know about him is a Stanford graduate did his PhD even in applied physics. Um, and he worked in a rather surprisingly wide variety of things before ultimately um, heading up the hardware systems laboratory over there at Park. So I'm not going to take any more of this time and pass the floor to Okay. Great. Well, thank you for having me today. Can everybody hear me all right? So um, I was asked to speak about solar concentrators, which is what I'll do for about the next 40 minutes. Um, I would invite people to ask questions along the way if you have any, um, or you can wait till the end. Either way is fine. Um, so um, Park... Um, is a research business now. We were, a, um, we were a captive research center of Xerox. We were spun off in 2002 to actually be an independent business. Uh, we do a lot of work for Xerox still, but now we um, have a much broader charter to work with other customers and to start looking at new um, technology domains. One of the most interesting things for the research community at Park uh, is clean tech, and we uh, basically had a bottoms up movement of some of the research community to start looking at projects that could address uh, issues of environmental concern. And this took the form of a, a study group initially, then finally a forum series. Some of you may have attended the forum series, but we, we were able to get access to some of the leading thinkers in issues of global warming, um, build, green buildings, toxins in the workplace, et cetera. And that provided the foundation for us to really start a number of projects which has now turned into a whole portfolio. Um, and in trying to characterize this portfolio, I'm not going to go into great depth on any of this except for the solar concentrators, which is really the subject of my talk today. But just to say that, apart from the fact that the slides don't show properly, oh, well, it's different that time. Um, I uh, just want to point out that uh, there are a number of areas where Park has been um, working in technology for a period of 20 or 30 years, all of them really related to, the, to printing, and that's for the parent company Xerox. But what we found is that a number of these capabilities really lend themselves directly to technology developments in the solar field, in clean water, and so that's really the basis for the work that we're doing. What I'm going to really talk about is the... Um, the work we've done in optical design associated with um, solar concentrators, that's all derived from the expertise we've developed over the years for Xerox in laser printing. So very precision optics, understanding how you manufacture optics at very low cost. Um, so the optical design capabilities play out in concentrators. They also are relevant to things like solid state lighting. But there's a set of these that we're now working on at Park. This is a really important curve. This is what's called a learning curve. And many of you may have seen these for the solar industry or for other industries. Turns out there's a fairly universal behavior. If you look at the, um, the price or the cost of some item, and you then consider the cumulative volume of that that's been produced in the world. And as you, as you appreciate, prices or costs tend to go down over time as people become more and more efficient. And there's usually a, t a characteristic learning curve associated with a particular industry. Well, the solar um, photovoltaic industry, if you look at the, um, the price for modules, which are the sort of the one meter size elements that you would put up on a rooftop, 
um, have really followed very closely one of these learning curves. And it's essentially an 18% reduction in that price for every doubling of manufacturing volume, cumulative manufacturing volume. This is called a learning curve. Um, so um, if you, well then if you project forward, you have to ask the question, for solar, when will it really be competitive with um, retail electricity? And you find that um, it's somewhere out here. It's when the, um, the price of a module is around a dollar per watt installed. So um, it's between a dollar and two dollars per watt is where you can get parity with the grid electricity at the retail rates. And that represents a cumulative volume of about 75 gigawatts. Right now we have a cumulative volume of about 10 gigawatts, maybe a little more. It's going to be some time before we, we reach 75 gigawatts. And so during that interim period, it's going to be necessary to have subsidies, feed-in tariffs, things of that nature to be able to drive the volume of solar up. So this is just a replot of the same thing. The blue curve is the um, module price per watt. And what I've contrasted that with is Moore's Law. Moore's Law is the um, historical scaling of uh, cost per function for semiconductor electronics. And you can see how much more, uh, how much more dramatically the cost of electronics um, has gone down over time. So PV has been on, by comparison, a relatively slow uh, progression forward. And what's really needed um, in the next five years, 10 years, are, is additional ways to, to basically uh, accelerate the rate of this uh, dropping down or possibly jump to a completely different trajectory. All of, the, all of this blue curve corresponds to conventional flat plate silicon photovoltaics, so the kind of modules that you see up on rooftops today. So there's this whole notion around, um, it's a different approach, which is to concentrate light. So instead of having the whole rooftop of a building covered with um, a semiconductor, wafers of silicon, the idea is to use optics to take light from a large area and concentrate it down to a small area. And then it's only at the small area that you actually uh, have to have the, the receiver, the semiconductor element that will convert from light to electricity. Um, if you concentrate at 500 suns, that's, this is meant to show you an area ratio of 500. So there's a football field, and the little red dot in the middle is 1 500th of that area. The concentrator system that I'll describe to you today is, is actually that. It's 500x in concentration. So it takes light at what's an intensity that's called one sun, which is just normal illumination, and concentrates it down to 1 500th of that area, 500 times more intense. And then you only have to put the receiver element at, uh, of that size in the concentrated spot of sunlight. Um, so you can imagine. Uh, you know, if, if in terms of production volume of the semiconductor, you go from needing football fields to needing relatively smaller quantities. And it's easy to think about how you could manufacture um, those smaller quantities. So this is just comparing side by side what I, what I said a moment ago. Flat plates, silicon photovoltaics. These are wafers of silicon. They're all put together um, under a sheet of glass, and they're interconnected with, um, with copper wires, basically. Um, and that's what you see pretty much everywhere today. Then there are these other interesting structures, like these large parabolic dishes. I think this is in Australia. Um, and this is called a concentrating system. There is a wide variety of concentrators. Um, we at Park have our favorite version, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But um, there are some that are very large. There are others that are small, different form factors. Um, conventional photovoltaics, generally there's no tracking system. You just let the thing sit at an optimal angle. And then as the sun progresses during the day, you capture the light. You can actually do better in efficiency if you're willing to track the sun. But then that adds cost to the system. In contrast, these um, concentrators must track the sun. They, if, you're, if you're off axis from looking at the sun, even a few degrees, there's no power output whatsoever. So you also need direct incident sunlight. You cannot use a concentrator in cloud cover. 
whereas the uh, flat plate silicon will work, and it's being installed today in Germany and other places in, our, in the northeast of the US, and you'll always get some power out even on a cloudy day. Um, I'm not going to get into all of these details down here except to say that um, flat plate silicon is completely dominant. Um, flat plate photovoltaics, including silicon and also the newer thin films you may have heard about, are about 99% of the PV uh, market today. Concentrators are a 1%, moving up to 2, 3, 4% of the market. Well, this just gives you an idea of the variety of concentrator designs that are out there. there have been, these things have been tested, tried over a period of 20 plus years. And they're only today really getting to the point where people see them as, as a viable competitor to uh, flat plate. Uh, photovoltaics. You've got your extraordinarily large uh, mirror structures. The, one of the issues with these things is they're so intense in their focal spot that they can just burn through anything. This is uh, plate steel that's basically been melted through using one of these. And this is like the experiments you did hope, as kids with magnifying glasses and insects possibly, hopefully not. But uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there are versions that uh, look more like a flat plate system. This is a, I believe, Aminix system, and it uses Fresnel lenses like what you would find on an overhead projector. And for each of those Fresnel lenses, there's a corresponding area of, um, they actually use silicon for their receiver element. Anyway, a variety of designs. You can get a sense of the intensity of the light at the focus. This is a system where um, there's a large area that's been concentrated down to maybe a um, you know, 10 centimeter square um, region. And you can see this large structure on the end. That's actually a cooling fin or a set of cooling fins. These things get very, very hot, and that's one of the issues. Um, this comes from a talk that um, uh, was in, in this online uh, publication, Inside Green Tech. Um, what they were looking at was um, sort of the, what they call the ecosystem of concentrators. It turns out there are devices that, um, that use silicon. They'll take, these are modest concentration systems, maybe 5X. You take a Fresnel lens, maybe it's plastic, maybe it's glass. You focus down to a silicon wafer, and um, maybe it's 1X to 5X concentration. Then there are the ones that I'm going to talk quite a bit about in a, in a, in a moment, which are more like 500X. There, there is a place to operate on both of these, because here the cells, the silicon, is relatively inexpensive. You're not getting all that much concentration, so um, you, don't, you, you, you can't reduce the, the amount of semiconductor very much. Maybe you go from uh, you know, uh, this much silicon down to that much, but it's not a huge reduction. So you need a semiconductor which is still relatively cheap or you would exceed your budget. Over here at 500X, you can afford to buy the very most expensive semiconductor, the most efficient semiconductor devices that are made. Here's a triple junction of three different materials all together. Uh, and I'll go into some additional detail about that. But it turns out there's sort of a region that they call the valley of death where um, you don't have enough concentration to really reduce the area of the semiconductor, and there's no semiconductor you can fit in here that will really um, do the job. So um, I'm not going to talk much about these lower concentration devices using silicon. I'm going to really emphasize high concentration, high efficiency in this talk. So high concentration, high efficiency, how do you do that? Um, what you'd like to do is capture all of the light from the solar spectrum. Um, a given semiconductor can only, only has one, what's called band gap, and that means one energy level. And if you have a photon above that energy level, you can absorb it and convert it to electricity. If you're below that energy level, you, you can't absorb it. You lose it. And further, if it's above the band gap, any additional energy it has abo you know, above the band, band gap is lost to heat. So people have become very clever in um, making structures that are essentially what they call tandem structures, where there are actually three different solar cells that are vertically stacked. The top cell strips out the really high energy photons, so it's a high band gap material. The next cell strips out the, um, got the, I did that backwards. 
<clears throat> the high energy photons are what you strip out last. You, you strip out the low energy, no, <laughs> that's right. That's right, I'm sorry. Blue, yeah, right, excuse me. Blue first, high energy photons first, um, low, lower energy photons next, and then the lowest energy photons last. And the way they make these is um, it's, a, it's an elaborate process. It's using uh, what's called heteroepitaxy. They're growing on a germanium wafer, first a gallium indium, um, gallium arsenide uh, layer, and then a gallium indium phosphide layer. And those three layers basically act like a series connected uh, set of solar cells. It's like three separate solar cells, but they're all built in the same material. It's a very elaborate process. These cells are quite expensive. <clears throat> and I'll show you in a moment what they, what they cost. Um, but anyway, you can see that each of the um, different parts of the solar cell is tuned to a different piece of the solar spectrum. Silicon gives you about 20%, maybe a bit more. Sun power has the most efficient cells, and they may, I think they're up to 23, 24%. These today are up to 39 or 40%, so they're, they're almost double in efficiency, but they're much more expensive. Um, so this shows you the different options, um, and what's plotted here is the cost of the individual cell in dollars per centimeter squared. And then on the right hand, uh, left hand side is what does the system cost you? This is the installed uh, cost with everything all together. Flat plate photovoltaics are over here. You can see the center of that is around $8 per watt. It's somewhere in the range of $6 to $8 per watt right now installed. And the cost of the cells per unit area is relatively low. It's, it's, um, it's under 0.1. These triple junctions, though, multi-junction cells are over more, at more like $10 per centimeter square. They're much, much more expensive. If you can concentrate enough and use a small enough area for each of your larger area of the concentrating optics, you can get away with using these higher efficiency devices and get the benefit of them. And that's what I'll be talking about the rest of this um, this talk. <clears throat> One thing that's really interesting about um, these high efficiency cells is that there's a roadmap going forward. This is from uh, the company Spectralab, and they're progressing along. They're up to about 39 or 40 percent right now. Well, they've got three junctions in, in, in uh, tandem. You can actually think about structures that go to four or even five uh, cells in tandem. It gets more and more expensive, more and more processing steps, more and more complicated, but you're gaining efficiency pr pretty rapidly, and you can just drop those devices right into a concentrator. So you take out the old cell, put in the new cell, and you have an overall system that's more efficient. Sure. But your process complexity goes up as does your sensitivity to as you do that. Yeah. I mean, people have worked through the economics of it and believe that for at least five, six junctions, the incremental cost um, to the, of the cell, you'll more than equal that in the, in the benefit, in the efficiency of the final device. One, one great advantage of increased efficiency is that um, many of the things you're doing with solar panels scale on a square meter basis, right? So if you have a lef, less efficient system, then to capture the same number of watts, you need a much bigger area. And all those things like the, you know, the, the aluminum framing and, the, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, land use, labor, all of those things scale very strongly with area. So anything you can do to reduce the area by making it more efficient is a huge win. Well, there are things even beyond multi-junction cells. Um, I won't try to explain um, any of this, but this is basically a, from uh, Martin Green at University of New South Wales, and he's trying to plot the different percentage efficiencies that are possible using some of these methods. <coughs> Single cells, that would be like silicon or gallium arsenide, one layer, and the, the maximum theoretical efficiency is 30, 31%. Well, the t tandem here means multi-junction, so two cells together. I was talking a moment ago about Spectrolab's triple junction, or tandem N equals three cell, and in principle you could get that up to 49%, but there are all sorts of new innovations people are talking about which could potentially get you up to 60, 70% efficiency. And again, 
These are expensive cells probably. They would not work in a flat plate structure where you had to cover the whole area with them, but in a concentrator where you can reduce the area, you, you, could, you could conceive of doing that. So Park um, learned about a very interesting concentrator design. Um, this was, the conception of this was um, a couple entrepreneurs together with uh, a professor at the new UC campus in Merced, Roland Winston. Roland Winston is the sort of, he's known as the father of non-imaging optics. Non-imaging optics are, is the use of optics to do interesting things with light but where you're not trying to form an image, just as it sounds. And that's what you're trying to do with a concentrator. You don't care whether you're getting a correct image of the sun. You just want to take the light from a large area, squeeze it down to a small area. So he had a notion of a concentrator which is about the most compact possible. It, in terms of F number, it's, um, it's an F0.25 system, and you can't go lower than that. The way it works is it's also a, what's called a Cassegrain configuration. It has two mirrors. There's a back mirror and then there's a front mirror. Light comes in and strikes the back mirror, is reflected to the front mirror, and then comes down through a hole to the receiver element where the solar cell is located. Um, you can see that again here. The parallel rays from the sun hit the primary, bounce up to the secondary, are focused down to the region where they are um, converted to electricity. And there's actually a little rod in here of glass, which is called a kaleidoscope and it's used to further uh, reduce by about a factor of two the size of the beam and also homogenize the beam, make it, make it more uniform. So um, these are made of glass. This is glass, this is glass. They have been mechanically assembled into a, a structure here with a front plate of um, just smooth glass to protect it. And um, this is the device that um, these two entrepreneurs were working on. They have a company called Soul Focus. You may have read about them in the news, but they are a, one of the high-flying solar companies. Um, and we started working with them and actually incubated their company at Park for about a, a year and a half. They're going after 500 suns. They're going to use very small amounts of the semiconductor. They're going to use the highest efficiency 3.5 devices, the triple junction I talked about, 40% out of the box. Um, and um, that's their way to uh, basically try to drive down the cost per watt. Yeah. Uh, a couple questions. What are the dimensions of uh, the Sure. So the primary is about one foot in diameter. Um, and the overall module, this is sort of a module, is about, you know, it's rough, it's a little more than a meter square. So then they would array these together on a tracker, and as I said, with a, with a concentrator, you have to track and follow the sun during the course of the day. And then doesn't the um, efficiency of the semiconductor itself determine <clears throat> the amount of heat that's done? Excellent question. That's an excellent question. Yeah, I'm going to, thank you. That's, that's a great question. Um, cooling is a big issue. Um, all of the concentrators that are larger than about a foot have to have some form of active cooling. They have to have, um, you know, a fan or water cooling, and that's a, that's a level of system complexity in the engineering that you'd like to avoid. So one of the things that appealed to us about the sole focus design is they had really homed in on um, the sort of the maximum size you could make while still doing passive cooling, yet while having an optic path, optical path which is very short. So the whole structure is only about five inches thick. Um, so it's, 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 that, that's really what appealed to us. It's also protected with a glass plate, which makes it amenable to cleaning, and it's not like having a big, um, you know, parabolic-shaped thing out in, out, in the, out in the wind and the rain. Heat is still an issue, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some thermal modeling results in a minute. Well, you know, 40% for the cell is fabulous, um, but you have to start counting up all of the losses that occur with the optics. Every time you bounce off um, the mirror, you lose energy. Every time you go from air to glass, you lose energy. The little gel layer that goes between the glass kaleidoscope and the cell, you lose energy. The net, net of it is that about one-third of the energy is lost in going through that structure down to the cell. 
So you have to take about 67% and multiply it by the efficiency of the cell, which is 40%, to get about 23, 24% efficiency. So these modules are, could you know, be, at, at their best, about 23 or 24% efficient. That's not that much different than um, SunPower's um, very best silicon cells. The whole game here is really cost reduction. Concentrators give you somewhat more efficiency, but, but it's really not an efficiency game. The whole thing here is to take most of the semiconductor, get rid of it, and replace it with things that are less costly like mirrors and metal frames and you know, just basically mechanical construction of parts that you can buy at much lower cost. Yeah. That's what I'm going to say about long-term viability. Um, concentrators, as you said, have been growing for 20 years, but right now, glass, silicon, and pla uh, glass, metal, and plastic are going up in cost, and silicon cells keep coming down in cost. Why are concentrators going up now? Well, I think the the uh, you know the trends in commodities like like metals and other things are you know this is this is a this is a new factor you know in the last few years that's become more more uh, more significant. Um, the you know if you calculate based on the cost of those materials a year or two ago and project forward at high volume what you could get with these concentrators, it's still dramatically by a factor of two x three x better than what silicon should be able to do. It's going to be challenged, though, more as the cost of the, um, these com replacement commodities that you're using go goes up. So this is the first um, installation of a sole focus panel. Each of these is about, you know, it's about, well, it intercepts about one meter squared of sunlight, which is about a kilowatt. And it converts about 25% of that. So it's about 250 watts. So each of these is about panels is about 250 watts. So there are four here, that's a kilowatt, and three of them. So this is about three kilowatts of power. Um, you can see you can make them quite large on a single tracking unit. Um, this is at the uh, City of Palo Alto water treatment facility. Sol Focus has just won a design competition in Spain. They were the first um, winner of this, and they're putting in like um, half a megawatt, which is really their, their, their pilot test. You know, and you can imagine, these things have to last for 30 years. Um, it's, a, it's a real challenge to make everything reliable enough and to prove that it's reliable enough with data that's only from, you know, a year or six months. That's, that's a big part of the solar game, though, is how do you prove that you're going to last yeah. Just very quickly, what does one panel typically produce? Cost or? Uh, uh, watts. Uh, oh, in terms of the embodied energy content? Um, so output and what, what, how much electricity? Yeah, I'm sorry. So this is about 250 watts right there. That, that, that the one little module is 250 watts. And that's what size is right now? It's roughly a meter squared. And that's roughly a kilowatt of sunlight per meter squared times 25 percent um, net efficiency. So at Park, we you know we've done a lot of work in optics, and we um, we looked at this and we thought it was really elegant. Um, and some of our researchers had ideas for how you might make this better. Um, um, one idea was to um, use only one optic. Because right now what they have is, uh, you know, two different pieces of glass. They have to be aligned. They have to be captured in place mechanically. Um, they have to seal the whole enclosure because if any water vapor gets into it, that will ruin the mirrors. Um, and so um, uh, the notion we had was to basically um, shrink everything, to go to the case where each individual concentrator element is more like an inch in diameter. Now the problem, and there's still 500 suns, so this is much more like the magnifying glass out on the sidewalk. Um, the problem is that now each of those elements has to have its own little semiconductor element. And now the semiconductor, instead of being a centimeter square, which is what it is in their first generation, it needs to be one millimeter squared. So you've got these little tiny pieces of this triple junction material that have to be arrayed on the back of this um, this piece of glass. Now this is, um, it has exactly the same structure. It has a primary mirror. It has a little dimple here which is metalized to be the secondary mirror with the cell down then at the back 
Um, and all of, that has, all of that is being done now with one precision molding step. So what you do is you basically spend the money to buy the tooling that will make this precise part, and then you replicate it over and over by stamping it in glass. Yeah, this is this is it's hard to convey. The, the yellow is the only glass, so it's the, the glass. The molded glass looks like this shape. The brown is um, you could imagine as a f some filler material just to give it strength. This is the design of an actual tile of this glass. We've actually been doing these molding runs with companies both in the U.S. and in Japan. It's still pretty small, and this is using technologies that have been developed for um, headlights, actually. People are, are, are molding glass headlights this way. So they haven't yet made it as big as you really need it to be to get the cost down. They're still at s t small s uh, tiles, but they do think they can scale up to about this size. And... Okay, this starts looking more like a wafer or a printed circuit board, and so the notion is you start you use high high speed pick and place machines, wire bonding machines, stuff that's all been worked out for very um, high volume assembly, and that's what you do to pre precisely locate the um, the individual uh, chips of the three five semiconductor. Um, so we've done efficiency calculations for this. It's a bit better. It's um, actually because you now don't have as many um, surfaces that the light has to bounce off of. It, it, once it goes into the glass, it's basically inside the glass. Um, and so you only have, you have fewer surfaces for losses. Um, when you count up all the losses, um, the net efficiency of this with a, um, a this, is, this, is, this is the a loss for the solar cell itself. Solar cell is 40% efficient, so that's why this says 60 Basically, you get about 30%. So from Gen 1, we were at about 24%. Now we're up to 28, 29% efficiency. And again, that's better than silicon. It's not hugely better than silicon, but the whole game here is not about efficiency as much as it is about cost reduction. Um, one of the issues you have to face, as I said, is that this has to track the sun. And this is a calculation of the, um, the sensitivity. In other words, how much power will come out of the solar cell if you start tilting the tracker off axis. And what it says is that you know, if you go more than about half a degree plus or minus, you start losing power. We're trying to design systems that are about one degree of pointing accuracy. And it's not that hard to engineer a one degree system, actually. We, um, Soul Focus is, is doing that. Um, others in the industry are doing that. It's not that difficult. Uh, yeah? Uh, how sensitive is that uh, your second design to cell-to-cell uh, uh, -cell misalignment? Very good question. I'll show, I'll show you. Uh, thermally, this is, uh, you know, you, you'd worry about, you asked the question about temperature. This is for the solid concentrator, the, the second generation molded one I was describing. Um, at peak, uh, illumination. Um, it's a very interesting. If, if the cell is creating electricity and dissipating it in so a load somewhere else, then it's actually taking away power from the sun. If the cell is not in a closed circuit configuration but is open circuit, it'll actually get hotter, which is very strange, but it's, it's true. <clears throat> because about, again, about 30% of the power is going into, elect is going into um, um, electrons. Um, so the hot spot here is not that hot. Um, it's only up to maybe 60 centigrade, 70 centigrade when it's open circuit. Um, silicon is reasonably sensitive to temperature changes, and that's one of the issues. In a, in a hot environment, the flat plate silicon panels will degrade. I, I, I don't actually know. I think it's like order of 10% of their efficiency will get lost. Um, these are very uh, much less sensitive to temperature, and you can actually operate these three five cells up to ninety centigrade without much loss in efficiency. Question? Yeah. Uh, I was involved in a study once where we were going to use concentrators. In this case, it was line concentrators with uh, uh, conventional silicon PV cells, and put them on cooling and use the hot water for domestic heat. Yes. So that. Uh, 
that, that even back in about 1985, that was just kind of borderline economical uh, using the technology at that time. That's, I think that's a great way to take a lot of the waste, what well, otherwise would be waste energy, and use it for a good purpose. Um, so far, um, you know, there are, there are interests of different companies in combining these solar PV concentrators with other things like um, ch absorption chillers on rooftops and things, but um, n nothing that I've heard about recently for the residential market. But I think that could be interesting. The problem with these, though, is that um, you do have to track, and generally on a root, your your home rooftop, this isn't the this isn't going to be the right approach. Yeah. What is the efficiency of um, that loss per degree C of silicon versus the three five materials? Because I thought they were very close. No, they're they're different by a factor of five at least. Um, I don't have it with me, but I could find that for you. Yeah. Yep. So there's less thermal degradation because um, less thermalization in the superconduction or because of triple more resilience? Uh, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Sorry, it's, um, so you said with the triple junction there's less thermal degradation compared to the silicon? Yeah. Is that because of there's less thermalization with the electrons or is it because the material itself? Oh, that's a good question. I don't think I know the answer to that. Does anybody know the physics? Why would why would the temperature coefficient of um, if, you know the temperature coefficient be um, significantly different for? I mean, to first order the band gap of silicon one point one point one five or whatever it is, EV is lower than a number of the um, junctions that are in the multi-junction cell, and it's sort of a <clears throat> I think it's probably a KT versus band gap kind of argument. Um, that's a very hand waving kind of. It's in the material itself. The silicon is different than the germanium uh, combination. But is, is it a KT versus yes, band gap yes, type yes, of yes, argument? Yes. Drive from nature. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's a just the way it is. Yeah, just the way it is. <laughs> um, that's a satisfying answer. <laughs> that's so. Um, how are we on time? When should we be? And do you think we should leave until we should open it up for Q&A or, or be done? Seven minutes to Q&A. Seven minutes to Q&A. OK. Um, this is an interesting graph. This just says that um, if the spot size that you put down on this little millimeter um, cell is too small, then the heat goes up, or the temperature goes up. So you really want to spread out that light over the entire one millimeter area. Uh, and this shows, you know, you, you could be at 70 degrees C for the junction if um, if the light is spread out. But if you're if you're really um, um, uh, constrained down to a tight spot, you could be um, you could be higher by maybe 30 degrees in that hot spot. <coughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the non-ideal non part of this. So, you know, anytime you try to make a glass optic or anything, anytime you try to make anything, you're going to have tolerance errors. And it's very important to try to understand how all those errors add up. <clears throat> One of the things we've had to do for um, laser printers is really understand when you have a multiple lens system and everything's a little bit off, how does that aggregate to give you the net error of the beam? So we've used those same techniques to try to calculate for this second generation molded glass optic, what's the, what are the statistics of the way that these manufacturing errors add up? So you start with the idealized structure. This is, the, um, this is basically the solid um, glass molded element. And you can model that, and of course, you know, if you do it right, you get a very nice focal spot. It's beautiful. But you start looking at how different errors affect it. You can, um, you can have all sorts of errors. You know, the, the alignment of the primary to secondary, maybe the molding operation wasn't perfect. <clears throat> maybe there's a radius of curvature problem on the backside, and you, you, there are probably 20 errors that you have to try to control for and specify to the vendor to make that part as perfect as possible. Here's one error. Another error would be, um, you know, where there's some misalignment of the um, 
primary and the secondary, and so the focal spot can do all sorts of things um, to degrade, which is, is definitely bad. One degradation is, is bad because if you don't have the light landing on the receiver, then you don't get the power. But there's another form that's bad, which is if your tracking is off, you might actually have this intense beam wander off your cell and be on some adjacent material that isn't supposed to get sunlight on it, and it could destroy it. So there are all sorts of calculations you have to do to make sure that things degrade gracefully as you, as you, um, as you um, mis-aim the, uh, the tracker. Yeah? So in terms of <coughs> Yeah. So, yes. So what we, what we do is we basically um, look at all the possible errors and then look at the um, standard deviation you might expect for each of those and then do a Monte Carlo analysis to, to aggregate those errors and make sure we understand the statistical result of those errors all in combination. And you can then do a really good sensitivity analysis with that kind of a tool. So we've, <clears throat> we've done that with thickness, decentering, tilt, pointing error, curvature. And what you end up with is a table that tells you, doesn't tell you immediately whether you can meet the targets, but it tells you what are the most sensitive variables. And here the radius of curvature is very sensitive. Um, <clears throat> the nominal value is 15 millimeters. Um, and so if you change that, go from, uh, I guess this is a 1% amount. You go from 15 plus or minus 0.15 and you get this, this certain contribution. So I can't tell you exactly what these all translate to. If, you, if you're interested, I could give you that data. But basically what it tells you is what are the big hitters? What are the big things you have to watch out for? Um, and I would say the molding that's been done so far, the one that we did at Park was definitely not right. And, uh, the molding companies bear, generally don't make it on the first try. They have to iterate. Um, and I think they're getting closer, but I still I don't think they're yet there with the second generation glass molded optics. It's really not ready for prime time yet. And molding is one of the key, key things you have to control. <clears throat> so, but it also allows you to change the design and make the design less sensitive to certain variables. So, Here's an example where um, the goal is to have all of the energy land within um, the one, in this case, 1.2 millimeter um, cell uh, size. And you can see this is a histogram of, of uh, basically where does the light land? Is it, is it all on that 1.2 millimeters or does it spill over? Or is it undersized? And by actually going from one design to another design, you can significantly tighten the distribution. So you can start playing games with this kind of analysis tool to see how can I make the design more fault tolerant. That's exactly what's been done here. And so we've done this iteration four or five times with Soul Focus. And again, we're still, I don't think they're there yet. But um, it's very challenging to make optics that are sufficiently precise to, to do this. So I think that's, I think that's what I had. And I'd be open to questions. Yeah, sure. Officially held up by the supply constraints of, of silicon? It is today. I mean, if, if you were, this only goes out to 2003. So I think up until that point, we weren't in the real bottleneck that we've had with polysilicon in the last couple of years. Yeah, it, it, would definitely flat, it would definitely come out more flat um, in the past. Um, and actually, some, some of the module prices have gone up. So yeah, that, there, there used to be a 
perturbation there. Um, there have only been a few sort of big innovations um, in solar cell manufacture, um, and um, that could be you know, like two or three major things that have been done, um, like the advent of wire saws. Um, I don't know when uh, solar uh, silicon started using wire saws, but it could, you know, they're, they're probably a little. I do think that's it. You think that's what that is? So, um, yeah, that was a big, big increase in productivity and, and decrease in wasted silicon. Um, so, there have been a few of those. Um, but otherwise, it's been a pretty, you know, it's remarkable how steady it is. And most industries, again, adhere to something like this. Yeah? Um, given the temperatures you're operating at, flat silicon panels versus things where you're concentrating, and given the materials uh, science, do you have any, any, any ballpark idea what the relative lifetime would be of, of these devices, given, uh, I think with silicon, uh, most people will quote you 20 years for about a, roughly a 10% degradation. Yeah. Oh, so, um, you know, Spectre Lab has done some amount of work on lifetime, but um, really the, the free five cells have largely been directed towards space applications, where 20 or 30 years is, I don't think, the, 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 the norm, the paradigm. Um, they are encouraged, the people who are using the cells are encouraged that they will meet the lifetime. NREL is doing all sorts of tests. You know, until somebody has these systems out in the field for 20 years, it's not going to be completely convincing, but, um, I, and I, you know, I don't, so I, I can't really say any more than that, but. Check back in the future. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's a real issue for, for, for any of these new technologies in solar, is just what, what will actually happen after one decade of use. Yeah. So, so, so why isn't anybody using diffraction gradings or something to split the wavelengths out and, and go after each one individually, especially if you're doing concentration? I mean, you could, you could effectively <coughs> set where the wavelengths fall on your, on your collector, so you could do yep. you triple junction. You, you yep. So there, there actually is an initiative that DARPA has supported called the Very High Efficiency Solar Cell Initiative. It's being run out of the University of Delaware. It includes big companies like Corning, and, you know, et cetera. And um, that's exactly what they're doing. Now, this is meant for a soldier. And the goal there is not cost. The goal there is absolute maximum area efficiency. You want to recharge your electronics in the minimum amount of time. <clears throat> and that is, the, that is the approach they've taken. They basically have an array of concentrators and they do beam splitting with dichroic mirrors and split off to the absolute most efficient cell you could, you could get for each of the wavelength um, you know, ranges. Um, I don't think, nobody's come up with a design for that where the cost of that optic, of those optics wouldn't be prohibitive. I mean, the sort of interference filters you would use are pretty expensive because they're vacuum deposited and multi-layer. So, um, but that's a very interesting idea. If you figure out how to make it in, in, inexpensive enough, that would be very interesting. Yeah? Does the cost per square meter, or square centimeter of the uh, triple junction cells stay roughly constant with the size? Or if you go to, say, Below a square millimeter, is there kind of higher losses and lower yield? You know, I think the yield is high enough that it's. I, um, there's probably some scaling with yield as you go smaller, but um, I, you may pay for that and just in, you know the, the loss in the soccer when they cut the things up. I'm not sure that because now you're, you're 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 dicing this thing into a, you know a million little pieces. Um, so soccer is an issue, and also the sort of edge exclusion area when you put down the um, electrodes, you have to do, they do fine lithography for the top metal electrodes. So I'm not sure the net, it's not like there's a big yield difference between millimeter and centimeter size for those, I, I think, for those devices. Yeah. Just getting on to the same question. Um, as you reduce the size of the active material, it's probably making the kind of thinner, less bulkier, and less expensive. So what is the limit? How small can you make the whole? Oh, oh, in terms of making the, uh, the optics, no, the whole the whole structure. The optics as well as the size of the active material. Can you go to several hundreds of microns or small? Yeah, I, mean, I think you get into um, alignment issues. Significant alignment issues. You also, um, you know, you, you probably want a, you want a certain thickness of material just so that it's self-supporting. 
<coughs> the, the thickness of the glass molded elements that I'm showing you are about a centimeter. So it's, it is sufficiently rigid that over some reasonable area it will stay flat, which it has to do in order to not have a pointing error. Um, um, and also the number of interconnects. I, I don't think anybody's done a completely principled um, exploration of you know, all possible sizes. Um, my suspicion is they hit a you know, reasonable spot for molded optics, but, but it, there may be something a little better. <coughs> sure. Can you comment on the totally solid cost of a sole focus system versus a thin film system? Mm -hmm. Well, everybody who's going to VC is saying, you know, we're going to get under a dollar per watt. <laughs> so focus is saying that, and solar says that, everybody says that. So, you know, I, I mean, I've seen the sole focus analysis of the <coughs> cost, um, and I believe with volume they, they will get there. And I think, you know, it's, you know, I don't know. It's a more space. follow-up question is, uh, uh, what percentage of cost is in uh, balance of plan so the tracker um, sole focus in order to meet what they want to meet for the integrated system, and that's all that really matters. Um, <coughs> the, the the tracker cost per watt is, is very aggressive, and there were no trackers out there that would do that. And their argument was that nobody the trackers were sort of a garage operation, nobody was really scaling trackers to make them um, cost effective. And so they bought a tracker company in Spain and are doing their own. And they're re-engineering it for high volume manufacturing. So again, that's, you know, you, you, yeah, right. So balance of system absolutely matters. And in their case, the tracker was, you know, way too high in terms of what you can just go buy. So they've, that's the approach they've taken. So it's you know it's a, it's very challenging to make all of this stuff work and get the cost to what the target really is and, and um, I you know I think the thin film folks have a have a reasonable shot at it and so does all focus. All right, one more. Sure. So um, the, the rooftops that Soul Focus is interested in are really like big box retail stores. You know, warehouses, flat roofs, flat roofs that are really sturdy. Um, they do, they've done the cal load calculations and they think that could work. Um, residential, there may be somebody with a concentrator for residential, but I'm, I'm sure it would be very low concentration because you, you don't want to have to move, you wouldn't want to have to move very much. If you go down to 2x, 3x concentration, it's conceivable you could do that without a tracker. But um, so I, I don't know. Is anybody aware of um, concentrator systems for residential? Generally, people are thinking about the utility scale power and possibly very large flat rooftops. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.